Today, our guest mentor is Dan Leonardis, and he's, whoa, director of Android Engineering at Viacom, and I'm certainly impressed. Um, so what we're going to do is have Dan talk for a little while, tell us about MVC, MVP, MVVM, and then um, we're doing, uh, we'll do q &A. So Dan, take it away. All right, great. Um, let me share my uh, presentation. I'll show it to you guys, and I'll start from there. Who drove the base? Raise your hand. Seth. Here they come. All right. Be quiet. All right. Here we go. Um, all right, so I'm going to be talking about, like uh, Barry said, MVC, MVVM, MVP. Um, these are structure Android architectural patterns or just architectural patterns that I've done in the past. Um, so I'm going to kind of go through them with you guys here today. Um, you can follow me on Twitter. I have a lot of the stuff I talk about today on my GitHub repo, and um, I've been writing some articles on the Medium, so you can follow me there for, um, you know, more advanced stuff. All right, so... <clears throat> we're going to go over um, each of these architectures. We're going to go over its history, uh, why it exists, use cases, and failures of these architectures. Um, I'm going to talk about MVC why, because that's kind of the starting point. But from there, everything kind of builds on itself. So MVP builds on the failures of MVC, MVVM, and vice versa. All right, so this phrase pretty much summarizes the whole discussion tonight where there is always a right tool for the right job and the right tool for the right time period. Um, so remember, you're not, you're really stepping to a field that spans a few decades. So what was good one day isn't always good the next. So different architectures are not wrong, um, but there's definitely best fits for different pieces. And you're going to learn that through your own careers and while you have this talk tonight, and you'll be, be able to figure out where you want to use different architectures. All right, so most Android applications are built around this concept, the model view control. It divides an application into three interconnected parts so as to separate the internal representation of information from the ways that the information is presented to the user. The three parts are the model, the view, the controller. The central component where most of the business rules go is the model. The model directly manages the data and is independent of the user interface. The view is any type is any output representation of information that the UI holds. Views generally get their information from the model. The controller can send commands to the model to update the model state or can send commands to its associated view to change the view's presentation of the model. So that's basically a, a standard definition of the MVC. Um, as you can see here with the diagram, uh, it all basically flows in a nice uh, circular pattern. The user presses a button, for example, goes to the controller, Mutilate something in the model. The model then says, the view, I got some update. Then the view goes over, updates something on the user interface. So a little history of where this came from. So we know what our starting point is. So everything starts with small talk. Yes. So um, I can't pronounce this guy's name. I'll give it a try. Turgave, um, a guy that worked at small, small talk in Xerox. Uh, really, this is where like Apple got its GUI interface from, from Xerox and all that. So, uh, why did this guy kind of do it is the next screen. It's simple to understand. Um, so MVC was used and it, because it enforced hundred percent, you can actually have a clean separation of concerns. So right around this time, object oriented programming is being talked about um, ways for modularization, reuse, this kind of fits in really nice because it has a clear separation of uh, concerns. It has their user interface, which could be reusable buttons and things like that. And it has your model. So really, this is this is a good time frame where they started off as saying MVC is now a good architectural pattern to use in the small. All right. So to to show a use case, I'm going to bounce out to my GitHub, and we'll take it from there and see how it looks. All right. So as you can see. It's nothing special here. It's an old, like three-year-old repo, but it really is an older, MVC is an older style pattern that, that people have been using in Android. Um, I really separated by domains here. So if you jump into your activities, you just take a look at an activity that I have here. You can see that basically what this is, is almost like what model view controller is. So you have your activity that you controller. You have your button that I have to go get. In this case, it's you know, a progress bar. And then I have a, oh, when it's click, go do something with the model. 
and my model sits on my application class in Android, and it says basically, go create a new Fibonacci number. Now, how does it flow back to the UI? I basically have a cursor here, a cursor loader, and if you know enough about Android, there's um, providers, services, and activities. Activities break down into fragments of views. What the provider does is provide the activity with, hey, you have an update, here you go. So very, very simple MVC. Um, other things that you see with MVC are things like uh, async tasks, where the async task may say, hey, I'm gonna load data, I'm running inside an activity, and that background thread can then go talk to your model, come back, and via the async task with the, um, once it completes, it can then update the UI. So it's just a very simple, you know, going around a circle kind of pattern. There's nothing really difficult with it, um, but it's the baseline of a lot of stuff that we have in Android, uh, in iOS. And a lot of that is because it's, it's simple to understand, simple to kind of use, and for little simple use cases, like this is really just to show off, again, Fibonacci sequences to uh, somebody that was asking me to do some kind of program for them real quick. This is, like I said, a couple years old. I was able to accomplish pretty quickly. All right, so back to the presentation. So where did this really kind of fall short? So this screenshot here is from Uncle Bob. And if you don't know who Uncle Bob is, uh, Robert Martin, you, you will. Um, change where it says the web and put like activity or more Android client material. Uh, oh, Jordan. Jordan, do you have a party going on in the background? Okay, so I got it. Down out. There you go. There you I'm go. gonna try to mute. No, he's mute now. I can see he's mute. Okay, okay. <clears throat> so what, what Bob Martin talks about is uh, the failure of MVC from a real world problem, which is time. So with not a lot of time and lack of discipline, developers of very large applications started to blend their logic. So it really was an individual problem. It started to become a team problem with MVC. More specifically, things like the controllers would eventually reach into the models and would tell the models directly what to do. Um, not say, hey, a button was pressed, but really say, hey, a button was pressed, you need to change state, and this is what you're going to do. A little bit too much information the controller talks to the model. The view would do the same thing. It would eventually reach into the model in order to get data and do more stuff with the state. And you ended up with a rat's nest of dependencies because updating a view meant changing a model, which meant change a controller. The boundaries are not well defined in a large scale application. So again, when I talked about small talk, small, as you started to develop larger applications, server level applications on the web world and in the mobile world, larger applications that have millions of users, I mean, MVC really wasn't cutting it. Not enough discipline started to break down. So Dan, to clarify, if you can go back to that earlier slide, um, you call this MVC failures. Is this a failure of MVC or is it a failure of people to strictly follow the MVC guidelines? More the latter. Okay. Um, and you got to remember that MVC was developed in the 70s really around a very simple idea of a simple GUI. A one button, do something. But when you have multiple actions happening um, on the screen, when you have multiple developers working on a GUI, you know, I mean, I work with a team of, my team right now is about 20 people. Uh, we have about five dedicated to the UI at any given moment. You start to run into this, you have to enforce discipline with MVC. You run short of having these separations of concerns. And as we go to MVP, you'll see how it's enforced. Um, and there's other problems with testing too. Um, as you can see with the Fibonacci example that I gave, um, like how do you test that? How do you test a button was clicked and then it went over to the application class, told the application to do something. You would need RoboElectric installed. You need to play with RoboElectric a lot because you may be missing a lot of the functionality you would be using with a database heavy testing, not really able to test. So there's weaknesses around there as well. Good? Very good. All right, moving on. So with this picture here, it's, it's, you basically end up with massive view controllers and um, <clears throat> you really lost the separated concerns in the heat of the battle. So what's the solution? Clean code. So I can only really talk about MVP and MVVM um, if you understand what clean code is and why it's important. So these two architectures look to force you to operate in a more disciplined manner. And when you're disciplined, you then have the freedom to do more things. So clean code is to the rescue here with a clear approach that is robust, stable, testable, modular, and easy to extend the code. 
So the concentric circles represent different areas of software. In general, the further in you go, the higher the level of software becomes. The outer circles are the mechanisms, the inner circles are your policies. Clean Architecture aims at making much of the business logic testable by looking at everything else as a plugin. This architecture works by implying the dependency rule, which states that the source code dependency can only point inward. Nothing in the inner circle could know anything at all about something in the outer circle. Enforcing this rule means that crossing boundaries should only be done by passing simple data structures between the two and using interface relationships such that the source code dependencies oppose the flow of control. A lot there. Let's break it down. So why even doing this? So each of these archi um, architecture produces the system that are, um, so in other words, clean architecture produces systems that are independent of frameworks. The architecture does not depend on the existence of some library or feature laden, -laden living software. Um, <clears throat> this allows you to use such frameworks as tools rather than cramming them into your overall system. Testable, talked about that before Barry. The business rules can be easily tested without the UI, without a database, without a web server, or any other external element, independent of UI. The UI can change easily and rapidly without the rest of the system needing to be changed. A web UI can be replaced with a console UI, for example, without changing any of the business rules. You're independent of a database. You could swap out Oracle or SQL Server, Mongo, Bigtable, CouchDB, or something else. Specifically to the Android world, you could use tools like um, Ormlight, Green Dow. Could you then go to room? Having this separation of clean code allows you to stick those tools in whenever needed. And you're independent of any external agent, um, agency. In fact, your business rules simply just don't know about where they exist. So imagine having um, business rules written in Java that I might need it on the web. It's just a jar. Bring it to the web. You know, go write some Kotlin server. Doesn't matter. Then bring it to Android. Complete independence. And that's what, that's what this helps do with clean architecture and clean code. So let's talk about the inner circle. The inner circle is the entities. They and encapsulate the enterprise business logic. Any entity could be an object with methods or it could just be a set of data structures and functions. When these entities are the business logic of our application, they encapsulate both general and high level test rule um, high level rules. They're the least likely to change when something external changes. So they give it like, hey, UI person wants to tweak, you know, pixel push. These classes never get touched. Um, yeah, all right, so next one. So for the middle circle, the soil from this later is basically a set of adapters that convert the data from the most convenient for the use cases and entities to the format most convenient for the external agencies, such as like a database or the web API or whatever, a UI. Um, it's in this layer, for example, that the wholly contained MVC architecture of, of a GUI. The presenters, the views, the controllers all kind of belong here. The models are just the data structures it's important to, to take home the data structures only that are passed between the controllers to the use cases and back from the use cases to presenters and the views. In other words, you're basically passing data objects around. And the outer circle, the outermost layer is generally composed of the frameworks and tools such as the databases, web framework, the Android operating system, iOS operating system, whatever you want to use this for, et cetera. Generally, you don't write much code in the layer other than kind of gluing everything together. Um, this layer is also where all the detail, um, this layer is where all the details go. The web is a detail, Android's a detail, iOS is a detail, database is a detail. Um, we keep all these things to the outside, but they can do no harm to the internal business logic of our application. How do you cross the boundary? So I'm gonna ask you to go back a couple of slides here. Sure. This one? Um, before that. Okay. Um, the middle circle, it says presenters views view models. Um, did I hear you say that everything that was considered MVC is in that green donut? No, not was everything I, in MVC. I, it, no, it's, it's what it is, is your, um, your presenters, your views, your view models. If you were doing MVC, it'd be almost like your view controller in a way would kind of be blending in as a presenter, but this really isn't used in MVC because you want to have more separation control and you'll see this with MVP and MVVM. So in MVVM, you'll get things like view models, where in MVP, you'll end up with things like presenters. Okay, I'm, maybe if you go on um, yeah. next step. It's, I'll, I'll it's a little bit much to absorb, I do admit, which is why everything I talk about today is on GitHub. There's right. examples of everything in detail, so you'll be able to see how this is all kind of glued together. This is really just the, 
um, you know, the high level of what clean architecture is, and this is disseminated out of like a 300 page book. So, okay, okay. <laughs> All right, so cross the bow, crossing boundaries. All right, so, you know, this is kind of an updated diagram. It's easier to understand from the original. Um, it doesn't have the, the dependency flow arrow, but what it clearly shows you is that the blue sections basically don't talk to each other. So, in other words, if I have like a, you know, web UI or not a web UI, web API that I got to call and I have a device that's being, you know, got to do something in, you know, internally with the device, like, you know, in the background, load some kind of data, I got to go to the web to do it. You know, it's good to view the controller over the web to do it. The blue circle areas like devices, the web aren't going to talk to each other. Controllers and gateways and renders aren't going to talk to each other. They got to go into the net use cases. So this diagram um, is definitely an updated one. This is one I use when I write on the medium. And this, I think, really captures what clean code was trying to do, just missing that dependency flow arrow. So let's go really and talk about that dependency injection. What does that really kind of mean? So the dependency inversion principle basically refers to a specific form of decoupling software modules. When, form, um, when following this principle, the conventional dependency relationships established by high-level policy setting modules to low-level dependency modules are reversed, thus rendering high-level modules independent of the low-level module implementation details. So at a high-level module should not depend on low-level modules, and B, abstraction should not depend on details, details should depend on abstraction. Now, what does that kind of mean? Let's let's visualize it because everything in you know yeah, I think in pictures. Just a quick second. pictures. Huh? Can you give me another look at that for just a second? Sure. Okay, good. So I like to you know the wording itself isn't as important as let's look at the image. Let's really get this this image in our head. You know. The traditional flow, um, this is the traditional flow um, with a lower level components that are designed to be consumed by high level components, which enable increased complexity. In this diagram, high level components depend directly on lower level to achieve some kind of task. With the dependency inversion, now let's visualize that. The goal of dependency inversion pattern is to avoid this highly coupled um, distribution with an additional abstract layer as to increase the reusability of the high-level policy layers. With the addition of an abstract layer, both high and low-level layers reduce the traditional dependencies from top to bottom. Nevertheless, the inversion concept does not mean that lower-level layers depend on high-level layers. Both layers should be dependent on the abstraction that draw behavior when needed from higher-level um, layers. So um, I probably lost some of you, again, with the definition. But, you know, the take home is this, to achieve uh, better clean code, you're going to want to use dependency injection um, in, your, in your architecture. And that's what MVP and MVVM kind of enforce is the dependency injection in order to go across boundaries with clean code. All right, so now let's talk about MVP. So Android applications that want to be built upon the strengths of MVC, but limit their weaknesses will kind of, would used to go with this architecture. Now, again, it's maybe a personal choice, but used to go with this architecture. So MVP is a derivative of the model view controller pattern where the focus is to improve the separation of concerns in the presentation logic, as well as support more automated testing. The MVP separates the presentation layer from the logic so that everything about how the interface works is separated from how it's rep um, <clears throat> represented on the screen. The three parts are the model, the view, and the presenter. The model defines the data to be displayed, the view is a passive interface that just basically displays the data as it routes commands to the presenter. The presenter acts upon the model and the view and is responsible for retrieving the data from the business logic and formatting um, what needs to be displayed in the view. So here's, here's how I kind of look at the details. Um, your view controller, basically let's say that's your activity or fragment, something happens, let's go through a little use case, goes to the presenter and says, hey presenter, I have something I gotta do which then goes over to the interactor, the interactor and says, all right, who in the model do I need to talk to? And then when it's done and the callback needs to be um, triggered, it's gonna go through the response model to the presenter, from the presenter through to the view model, what is, what is then from the view model, it goes to the view controller. So in interface terms, which is just your contracts in, um, in Java, and I'll stick with Java at this time, um, you're gonna say that the view model is an interface which the view controller implements. Your response model is the interface that the presenter uh, implements. This allows that flow back to happen and where you're only pushing data forward via dependency injection. Everything on the left is um, 
platform specific. Everything on the right of the dashed line is going to be your business logic. Here's another part of the clean code architecture and how it would look for maybe just a data ingestion type of view. Um, here we have a gateway. Um, above is basically, above the dashed line is platform independent, that's your business logic, and below it is basically your dependent on a specific subsystem. So the beauty of clean code, um, as you can see, these gateways and interface, and it specifically talks to a specific gateway API. Because it's on the outermost circle, if I want to change the way the gateway implementation is done, and I want to change all the APIs to do something different, I have the ability to do that without ever affecting my business logic, because all the business logic knows about is the interface contract of the gateway, not the gateway implementation. And that's the power of clean code. So a little history. Um, so although MVP was really around since the 1990s from uh, Talgent, which is an AB, Apple, IBM, and HP joint venture at the time, it became really evangelized by this man, Uncle Bob. Uncle Bob's book, Clean Code, is considered a must read by any serious developer in our craft. It hammers home all the disciplines needed to really test our applications at 100%. And handles all the weaknesses of MVC to support even larger applications. Let's go over an MP, MVP use case. All right, so this little simple example that I have is um, an MVP. I said MVC, I'm, I apologize. Eight. Um, it's an MVP um, built application. All it does is it goes to a, a web API and gets a list of movies that are now playing, and then it just puts them to the screen. Scroll to the bottom, it loads more. So let's really take a look at how the flow from the view controller goes into the business logic and it comes back out. That's all I'm gonna look at. This is open source, it's on the GitHub, you guys can play around with it as needed. So let's dig in. <clears throat> so, the first thing you can see is that, as I said before, the activity is implementing a now playing view model. So if you remember that flow, this is the callback. So there are callback contracts in now playing view model that the now playing activity will implement so it knows how to get a callback in order to update the UI. So that's the last piece, but I'm just showing you that here so you can see it from the detailed diagram that I show. So let's see where this begins. <clears throat> I was hoping to have this a little more done, but <clears throat> got home late. Okay, so here we go. So as an example, here's where I have to maybe load more information. And it calls load more info on the presenter. So that's the first part. The view controller is going to the presenter saying, presenter, do something. So let's look at this presenter. So here's the presenter contract. I could load more info when I start, when I stop. I start with a bundle of saved instance, my data restore. This is that interface, that whole dependency injection I was telling you about. This is the interface, not the implementation. Like well, the implementation. This is the implementation of the presenter. The view controller only knows about the contract of the now playing presenter. The now presenter impl is the one that actually does it. So for loading more info, it goes into the interactor. See how this is flowing? So this is the presenter, which basically knows how to make the, um, the business logic look good for the UI, but it's passed throughing um, from the view controller to the presenter to the interactor. Now let's take a look at the interactor. Can you see, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm anxious to see, because I'm not sure I understand what an interactor is. So an interactor is basically, um, again, another inter interface. This is the MVP pattern. Everything's an interface. Um, let's go to the impl and see what's going on. So what an interactor does is it interacts with all your other models in your system. So you're gonna have data models, user object models, um, maybe something needs to update state. Like that is what the interactor is gonna interact with. The interactor is specific to a, um, uh, a presenter. So I have now playing presenter, it's gonna to talk to a now playing interactor. If it needs to talk to another interactor, I can have multiple interactors talk to one presenter. So this is really more of the business logic specific person that's gonna know how to talk to the other entities with inside my um, business logic. So if I go to load, find it. what does it do? It basically says, look, if you have a loading thread, um, 
just register a callback for when the, the thread has data. If you're not loading data, just go load data. That's it. So how does this get backwards now? How do we go from the interactor all the way back? Well, we want to look for the response model. And there we go. Right here. So basically what happened in the thread, so when the thread's done loading data, it's just a Java thread, just a plain thread. Um, when it's a good use case and it has data to show, basically it says, okay, I'm ready for my callback to be triggered. And it says on the main thread, trigger this response model. And it has a weakness, weakness a weak reference because you have to know Android loses as references as possible. Um, and it says, look, I have info, info that's loaded. So all it is is a contract so that way I can go from the business logic all the way back to the view controller. So let's go take a look at this now playing um, what's it called? release model, response model. All right. What does this look like? Just contract, just an interface. Who implements this? And we want to take a guess. Who, who implements the response model from the interactor? Anybody? Yeah. Hello? Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll give you the answer. Um, Cause I know it's late. It's the presenter. There it's right there. So that's that whole flow diagram. And I'll go back to it after I'm done here where you can see that now we're going backwards up. We're going from the business logic back to the, to the view controller and this response model contract is being handled by the presenter. And this is what the presenter is doing. And this is very important to know. The presenter is translating internal business logic to be shown to the UI. So in other words, you have business logic that specifically says, I have a class that has maybe A and B in it. But your UI wants to be able to say A plus B is C. Where does C come from? In here, the presenter is going to create that data specifically for the view. And now let's see how it goes all the way back up to the, to the view controller. So you have this now playing view model. We, we talked about at the beginning what that is. That is a contract. Who implements this contract? Anybody want to make a guess? I gave you the answer in the beginning. The presenter? The activity. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Close. No, it's fine. You guys are learning this. This is years of work. This isn't like something I picked up on the side. This, this, this is a while. So um, this is a, not easy to understand in the beginning, but once you understand it, you see how the flow goes. And this example is a very good example. You, it'll pop one day. And let's go back now and take a look at that diagram. It should make more sense. Here's that diagram. So we started with the view controller, we moved to the presenter, we moved to the interactor, and then to go back from the interactor, once the interactor loaded data from the web, we went through the response model, and the response model is just an interface that the presenter implements. The presenter goes back and says, well, I need to take this A and B and make C. It does that and passes that data model through the view model, and the view model is nothing but an interface that's implemented by the view controller. So because of these interfaces all over the place, I can easily pop things out, and pop things in and never break the contract. I don't care how it's implemented. I care that they are handling a specific contract. And that's the beauty of MVP. Each one of these pieces can be individually tested with unit tests. They can be automated. You can then say, I'm gonna test my business logic on the right without any Android UI. I know it'll be the Android emulator running. Um, I could test things on the left without having any databases ready, any web, API is ready. So your testing went from very low to almost 100% with this type of architecture. So one of the things I'm noticing here, if you go back to the slide that you were just talking about, the temptation to think of MVP as just the same old M and V, but P substituted for C is wrong. What we've got here is that the P in MVP stands for presenter which sort of replaces a different component, not the controller in MVC. Am I making any sense? 
So and you could say no. No, no, it's 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 almost the same, okay. but it's slightly different. So your your view controller is still there. Yep. Your model is still there, and your right. view is still there. But you're adding a presenter, which does all the work that the view controller used to do. So the view controller in this case is just the glue, where it's saying basically, all right, a button got pressed. Pass that button information to the presenter, and that's it. So the view then, model takes the place in MVC of sort of the view and the model in MVC. Yeah, it, yes, yes. And similarly, the view controller takes the place of what was the view and the controller in MVC, and the presenter is a new piece that interacts with the stuff on the other side. Correct. And this is all starting from the clean code perspective of separating those um, layers. Um, and right, you, you're basically seeing the enhancement of MVP via clean code, which takes that little bit of that little thing that MVC was and yeah. saying now if you really want to make more robust code that is clean, this is the way to do it. Now, is it fair to say that the most important element here, um, the thing that really makes a big difference, the biggest difference between MVC and MVP, is in MVP, you've got these interfaces that lay between the, the layers, and everybody has to talk to the interface in having, instead of having the layers talk to one another directly. Is that a that's fair right. statement or too simple? That's, a very, that's accurate. The, the interfaces are between everybody now. Okay. Which is one of the, if you ever read a book, um, Effective Java, one of the rules for Effective Java, um, hopefully there's one for Effective Kotlin, um, basically you code to an interface, not to an implementation. If you do that, you will achieve better OO. Okay, there's some children or yelling in the background. Whoever has got that going on, please mute. Great, okay, thank you. Dan, keep going. Uh, okay. Anybody have questions? So, um, yeah, one question here. Uh, it seems like um, you can write the same program in any of these architectures. It's just once you know how to do it this way, it's just more modular, right? And easier to maintain and test and whatnot. Yes, mm -hmm. and that's the whole point of what we're doing. We, you know, if you're going to work for a place, they're going to want you to code faster and get more features out. And if you're not disciplined up front to be clean and have uh, tests around it, you don't know what you're going to break in a very large system. So um, to get started with starting to code in this sort of model, should we just like first write an app in MVC and then rewrite it basically in MVP, like a simple app? Is that, would you suggest doing that or? Um, probably or not. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, if you already know how to write an app and let's say MVC, then I would say just write it from scratch on MVP. Um, okay. because you're going to need to get disciplined and understand that you're going to be doing a lot of interfaces everywhere in order to separate your, your code control and the GitHub example I have and it showed is basically a great example to look at where you could see how this interface just bubbles through and bubbles down. And you can also see the dependency injection of how, as I go from the view controller to the presenter, from the presenter to the interactor, every time I new up an object or um, pass data through, I'm always passing data objects down from the high level to the low level, and that's the dependency injection, stuff I've talked about following the clean code. So, okay. And my other question, so MVP and MVVM, are those specific to Android, or are those also, can you also implement Not at all. those? Oh, okay. Every one of these architectures could be done on the web, could be done okay. on Android, and could be done on iOS. I have done all of them everywhere. Cool. Um, iOS, I think they call MVP Viper, um, which I'm not going to bring up, but basically it's just another way where they take the R and routers of what they call view controllers, but it's the same, same thing. So whether you do it in Swift, whether you do it in Objective-C, whether you do it in Java or Kotlin, it's the same architecture. Cool. I did have a question. Um, the only exposure I had is to MVC, um, and I have used it with Ruby on Rails. Um, one of my aggravations uh, with Ruby on Rails is the association um, with the model, um, setting up a program, kind of realizing it was wrong, and then 
not being able to just change one little part, kind of having to change the whole thing, like having to rework that whole thing. Um, I am just a junior programmer, so I've never worked on a team. Um, I would like to find out though, because I, I do, I have taken Java and I have done basic work with Android. I haven't run into that thing where you couldn't just add stuff. So if, if you don't mind, could you just talk about what your process is in a professional setting for having something, I mean, or, or do you even do that? Have you guys just thought about it so much that you really don't have to go back? Because the associations in Ruby on Rails, I don't really like it because of that. So, <laughs> sorry. That's perfectly fine. Um, I don't know Ruby on Rails. Um, typically my backend web stuff has been, we read it in Java or JavaScript, but the architecture definitely holds up. Um, so you're asking about my thought process. Um, yes, I've done enough time that it's, it's hard to think about it, but I generally you're gonna wanna start from the inside out. What are your use cases? What are you trying to build? And it all starts with what? What are the requirements of the system? Um, when you know that, you can start writing your use cases, your business logic. Okay, like for example, I need to load data from a web, okay. What does that data look like? All right, well, I gotta have, you know, let's say from an outplaying movie perspective for the example, I gotta have a title, a date, I gotta have um, maybe an image that has a URL. So, you know, start with the internal, that's the in, inner part of the onion, the inner part of the circle um, diagram I showed you and say, okay, what do those classes look like? And then from there, build out. How do you interact with them? Um, if you gotta go to the data from the web, What's your gateway look like, or your controller, I should say? What, what does the API look like for getting data from the web? Well, that should be encapsulated, right? Interface. Now go implement the interface. How does it actually work with this API? And you already start to start um, laying out this onion architecture, and you'll already have clean code separating because you'll have an interface that says, how do I, you know, what's my contract? Now go implement the contract, now you get the data. And then you can focus on the UI, where you'll say, hey, what's the presenter? What's the view controller? And doesn't even be the Android specific. I think that would probably be the best way to tackle how to start. And I would add that everything you do with business logic, just write unit tests for, um, because the easiest way to define your business logic. So if you remember I said A plus B, how do you equal C? Like if I had that in some kind of business logic, I can write a unit test for it. I can automate it. So as I start to expand my application, as I make it more complicated, I have 100% test coverage. I know I didn't break something else by changing another part of the code. All right, move forward. Any other questions? All right. So now we did all this talking about MVP, and now here I am going to come and tell you these failures. <laughs> wouldn't so, you know it? It wouldn't you know. Um, so I wrote I wrote an article in the Medium about this, um, but I'm going to rehash it out here. Um, that MVP MVP does have some shortfallings, and um, some of it we'll talk about MVVM being superior before I talk about MVVM, but just keep those tidbits in mind. So as I define MVVM, you could say, oh yeah, now I know why I beat out MVP. So from an Android perspective, um, again, Android perspective, MVP fails because you have data binding, you have Rx, and you have architectural components that had come out in May of last year. So <clears throat> with, with basically the debate about Android data binding was do you use, um, or, or binding data, so to say, is do you want to use Android data binding, what do you want is butter knife as um, your tools to basically grab entities out of the screen real fast. Um, so we hashed it out, um, at least for my group, on Slack a few times. And assuming you made the leap to use it, you got benefits of direct access to your views via binding objects. So if you used Android data binding, you basically had an object that was generated for you. So you'd be able to say, in that object, I have all my view elements that I can directly access. It was kind of a powerful thing. More important than that, you got the, this thing called Android Observables. Android Observable allows you to um, update the data binding passively. So you didn't, get, you didn't get that before. So back when Android first came out, you had to go find the view by ID, grab it, and update it manually. With, with this data binding, you kind of could done it, you couldn't do it passively. So do you want to talk a little bit, just to give a brief summary of data binding? People listening might not be familiar with that, what that is. That's fine. Um, yeah, the Android data binding was um, about two years ago. Maybe it's it's, it's um, a couple of years ago. A couple of years ago, about three or, years ago. So or they, they I'm came, thinking three or four. No, mm -hmm. it mm -hmm. was 
two. Yep, only two years ago, I think. Well, the take home is this. With, with data binding, um, you actually had a object that had all the views in it. That, so in other words, if I wanted to have a screen with a button, I get an object and I'd be able to say object.button. Where before, I didn't have that capability. I had to go look for the button by calling find view by ID, which basically said, I don't know where the view is, Android operating system, tell me when you get the view, and I'm gonna then typecast it to something specific, which could throw an error, runtime error, because I have to you know, cast it, I'd be cast in the wrong thing. So um, with Android data binding, it gives you not only the, an object with the, the direct access to the view, but it also gives you the ability to say, hey, I'm gonna update this view passively, and you do some work in XML and say, hey, um, I'm gonna, with an Android observer, we'll be able to say when this view model gets touched, you know, do some of the logic in the, in the XML. And that's kind of a lot of uh, what Android data binding gave you. Without it, you basically had Butterknife. Um, Butterknife was a nice tool where basically you could use Android annotation or Java annotations to basically say, annotation this view, annotation that view, and you had to direct access to it that way. Um, so because you have Android data binding, what happens is with MVP, you typically don't use it because the presenter, um, I'm sorry, the view model, which is an interface that's implemented by the view controller, basically just says, here's the data, now go put it to the view. And because it's using, um, you just have data and you're putting it to a view, you don't really need data binding. You, you didn't really know where to bind the data. So MVVM has these words in it. It actually states you will bind here. It's a very different way of looking at the data flow. So because they use terms like binding and subscribing and MVVM, it makes more sense if you want things done passively, you're gonna be using MVVM in this case. So <clears throat> where do you stick your subscribers? So if you don't know what Rx is, um, real briefly, Rx is basically a reactive way of writing applications. So functional reactive programming is a paradigm where you're basically writing functions that don't actually change state and you can actually be event driven, and that's what Rx gives you. It's a very simplistic way of looking at everything, but because Rx is now the way that everybody does threading in the client world, so Android and iOS, this is all we really should be coding in, um, it's not clear in MVP, where do you bind? You know, so if you're subscribing to an event coming off something, some database, if you're subscribing to an event from something from a server, <clears throat> where do you do that work? Do you do it in the presenter? Do you do it in the view controller? It was really never clear in MVP where to do that type of work, where you would do that type of um, reactive subscriptions. Where MVVM, again, the words they're using is you're gonna bind to your data. Your view is binding to data from the view model. So they're already put in these terms into MVVM. So again, the winner is MVVM here, not MVP. And <clears throat> I'm just trying to read my notes here. Okay, so this is the Android view model. This came out this year, or no, I should say 2017. Um, so what is this? With, with Android, you know, for those that don't know Android, um, what you have is you have a life cycle, which means that anything created, any data that you nude up on the, on the heap in on create would be removed when on destroy was called. All right, that was a very important tidbit. Um, that prevented us from doing really um, a lot of landscape views and because every time you rotate the screen you had a, you lost everything. So um, what they came up with finally was they said look we're going to have an Android view model. Again their words view model and they said that they we're going to have this view model maintain scope that's not tied to an activity but tied to when an activity is actually removed off the, off the uh, Android history of what a screen shows. Um, so to simplify it, if you had two screens, screen A and screen B, and I navigated from A to B, and then B to A, B gets removed off the stack. If I was to rotate the screen before I backed from B to A, I would be called on on destroy and lose my data. But if I used an Android view model, the only time I lose the data is when I remove B off the stack. So that's a really simple um, high level view of it, but because that now exists, it was the um, final nail in the coffin and MVP was no longer the best um, way to build your app. And Android was, the Google itself was supporting a more of a MVVM type of flow. 
All right. So MVVM, model view, view model. The model view, view model is similar to MVP, but with a few key differences. In traditional MVP, the presenter owns the references to the view and the model and communicates with these two entities to perform presentation logic. In MVVM, you invert the dependency arrow between the view and the presenter and rename the presenter to view model. This newly renamed view model does not act upon a view as a presenter would, but instead provides the view with an interface so the view can bind in order to observe the changes and propagate the user actions and updates the rest of the system. And here's that detailed diagram. All right, so I took the two diagrams I showed you before, put them together, came up with this, and this is now what's specific to MVVM. So let's go through what it would look like. Notice here that the view controller talks directly to the view model. The view model talks, let's say, directly to um, some kind of entity. And it itself might be listening, uh, um, subscribing to some kind of event on a gateway or whatever internally in the business logic. And the view model is now saying, all right, I have my data. And the view itself is subscribing to the view model. So because this terminology binding and subscribing is um, natural to MVVM, when you're using React and when you're using Rx and creating reactive um, programs, MVVM is definitely the winner in that case. So the history of where it came from. So MVVM was invented by um, Microsoft architects Ken Cooper and Tim Peters, specifically to handle event-driven programming um, of user interfaces. <clears throat> so let's go into an MVVM example. Now, again, there's going to be Rx in here. It's, that's okay, but um, the takeaway is where's the view controller, where's the view model, how's the view model doing data, and how is data coming back to the view controller. So that's what I'm trying to get in, into everybody is what's the flow look like. So again, it's the same app, the same UI, the architecture is 100% different. So notice there's no interface here. There's no interface. So how's it really working? Can you go? Uh, can you scroll back up to the top again there for a sec? Okay. So there's an interface. And there's no real interface because of subscribing to data. All right. So there's an adapter in here. I need to update. Let's go find the subscriber. All right there it is. Binding. Again, you don't got to know what a disposable is and all that, but what you really should take away is the view controllers binding to data on the view model. Here's my view model, my now playing view model. I am binding to it and I'm saying, I'm listening for data coming from you. And when data comes from you, I will update my screen. It's a very different flow. We're now we're not pushing and waiting for callbacks. We're just listening. We're just subscribing. That's it. Let's take a look at the view model. So I have a question. Yes. Um, is the bind method is actually called on the on create or like when it's gonna when when is when is that gonna uh, like be run? Okay. Okay. Not start. Right there. Now you're probably wondering the same as most people like hey, why do you do it in on start not on create? Typically, most people do it in on start because that's when the view is gonna be populated. So imagine I had a screen that was just if in Android that you hit, and this is, this is very Android specific. If I hit the home screen button, my view controller, my activity, my fragment, they're not destroyed. They're in a pause state. You know, they've been told to stop. So because they've been told to stop, I'm going to no longer register at anything the view model happens. The view model is still there. The view model is updating. I may have some kind of service that I'm listening to and I'm constantly updating but I don't really care what the screen looks like. The user doesn't care what the screen looks like. So processing any data in the stop state makes no sense. 
But when they start back up and the user actually wants to see data to the screen, I will then rebind to the view model and say, oh, I got the latest information, let me show it. And that's why it's done, the binding is done in on start and the unbinding is done non stop. All right, so let's go back to the view model. And it's that composite, uh, composite decomposable clear is, that's doing the unbinding, right? That's correct. Mm -hmm. It's basically a, a bag of objects that I have to dispose of, and Rx allows me to do it in one call. Now, there is, is there a reference to the view model code in the activity that we're looking at? Yes, right here. And this is, and again, this is because you get Android view models. If you didn't have Android view models, there's other ways to do this with Dagger and doing dependency injection, but this is an Android view model, meaning it's inheriting out of an Android class. It allows me to go past the activity lifecycle. I now have access to it directly. So that's where I'm getting my view model from, right here. All right, let's take a look at the view model. So again, the view model extends the, the now point. Yeah, hey. Uh, I, I guess I was going to ask, um, is there always an assumption that if you're using MBVM that you're going to use Rx, or can you do it without using Rx? You could do it 100% without Rx. Okay, thanks. The reason I do it with Rx was, um, at the time, I was an MVP fan. A lot of our tests were automated, and then as we started using Rx, we fell short. Where do we put our subscriptions? Where do we, how do we, you know, handle X, Y, Z? And as soon as the Android view model came out, we said, nope, that's it. MVP no longer um, is the best option for large scale Android applications. And we went to MVVM. All right, so view model, that's an Android specific view model. And here's what I'm doing here. All right, so let me look at what specific calls. Let's say something to load more data. That big guy. All right, so this big method right here does most of the work. So forget what this is, just focus on here since we're not trying to really focus on Rx too much. So from here all the way down, the view model is basically saying, I need to go get data. When something gets pressed down, when someone scrolls the screen, I need to go load more data. What do I do? So it's filtering scroll events here. It's updating the UI saying, show a presenter. Meaning view model, again, it's updating its view model and then some sort of somebody subscribing to that, which means they'll update the actual adapter. And here's where we're gonna actually fetch the data. What is this view model doing? It's basically saying, look, I need to go to the some gateway. I should have called a controller, but it goes to some kind of gateway and it says, go get me my data. So the view model is directly accessing a gateway or a controller or an entity and saying, go do something. There's no interface again here. Maybe the service gateway is the interface, but the response model don't have it here. And in MVP, you did. In MVVM, you don't. Because what this Rx is doing is saying, it's going to wait till the data comes back directly off this internal business logic. And once that gets back, I basically translate it from external to business logic. Then I translate it again from business logic to what the view needs to do. And then I just tell the view down here, hey, view, you got data. And what does the view do? Let's go back and take a look at the view. That's the first thing I said. The view is binding. And the view is just listening. The view controller. Hey, data is ready from the view model. Go update my view. And that's it. That's the flow. So a little simpler than MVP, um, but at the same time more powerful because everything is event driven and not, um, you know, being more forced through. So not as much imperative code. Always still that separation of use cases though, so that we still adhere to 100% to the clean code. Quick and question. Oh no, um, failures. Yeah, right? I was gonna right. shock okay. everyone. Ryan, you have a question? Yeah, so I'm wondering like someone, you know, who's more of a beginner, if I wanted to eventually learn MVVM, should I first learn MVP? 
and then learn MVVM? Do they kind of, I, it seems like they kind of build on, it kind of builds on MVP. Bingo. They build on it. You gotta, again, everybody stands on the shoulders of somebody else and goes up a level. So we started with uh, that Russian, I hope he's Russian, Travatsky, whatever his name was. <laughs> then MV, MVP came out in the early 90s. And then as people started to develop event-driven software, they said, I need something better. MVVM came out, all right? And now MVVM has failures. So you could see how there's a constant flow and a constant change in our world. Um, so for a beginning like yourself, I think the best way is to definitely start with MVP because most of the um, mid-level people that come across um, for, for trying to get jobs, they're going to really know, they should know MVP very solid because it forces a lot of more automation, a lot of more automated tests. Okay. MVVM is definitely a, a stronger architecture to know, but it could be a little more confusing. Got it. it seems as if MVP or MV, MVC at least is just built right into the, you can't do anything in Android without it. Am I right? Correct. And all of these basically build on pawn that. They all talk about a view controller. They all talk about models but the way they do their flow is what's important. So you're going to flow around with, um, and they all, you know, MVV, MVVM and MVP both doing clean architecture. The MVC did not have the same flow um, using dependency inversion, meaning um, there was no interfaces, you know, there was not a lot of testability uh, and separation where you get that with MVP. And as you go to MVVM, you get that more event driven type of architecture. Any other questions? On to the failures? On to the failures. So um, to shock everybody, so you're thinking, oh, MVVM finished. No, no. So um, unless you can model your entire system synchronously, a single asynchronous source breaks imperative programming. And I'm basically quoting Jake Wharton on this one. And he's 100% right. So basically with Rx, does this really hold true with MVVM? Take a look. Let's take a look. So. With the, the little source code that I showed you, um, where the cloud on the left is like a service call and the little phone emoji right is your view model. Again, not the view control, the view model. Um, you basically saw something that looked like this. Uh, we get an event in the view model. We have to filter it, okay? There's no problem there. We then have to reach out of the stream back to the view model and say, hey, update something in UI. Don't really like that. And then we have to switch to a background thread and go to this, do some kind of service call. Okay, no problem there. Receive the status back. And we have to translate that from internal logic to business logic. Uh, I'm sorry, from external to business, from business to what the view model looks like. We, we switch back to the main thread and have to update the UI. Um, you know, don't really want to do that. There's a side effect. And at the bottom, we did the subscription. We said, okay, now we're ready to, to finalize everything. So. The second red line was basically things like if there's an error or maybe remove uh, a spinner and the bottom subscription was, okay, now you're in a settled state. And the problem with this is as you start to do MVVM and RX alone with the architecture I showed you, you end up looking like this. Every single event starts to have its own stream and it becomes a nightmare to test again. So you, now you went from clean architecture where you had you know, clean separation of uh, concerns. You had everything module, you could test. And now with multiple streams in Rx, it's like, well, how do I test through the stream? So as you guys learn Rx, you'll start to notice it's hard to test. It's hard to test because everything's got to flow on the screen in like a kind of a stream format. And to test it, people started doing things like, well, I'm going to take a piece out of the stream and test that one piece because that's modular. And that's where it started to get confusing. And that's where MVVM failed. So as you start to make um, Rx reactive type of applications. As you do functional reactive programming, you're going to notice that MVVM on itself falls short. And really, what you want to go then towards is what I've recently talked about. It because Barry saw me at the Android meetup was reactive architecture. Um, I'm not going to go into reactive architecture right now, but the goodies are: I, I wrote a couple articles on the Medium about it. I have GitHub articles, uh, GitHub source about it. So if you really want to be challenged and really want to be writing functional reactive programming, this is the way to do it. This is the cutting edge stuff everybody's doing. It's also known as model view intent. But the way I look at it is everything can't just be MVV, whatever. It's really got to be uh, a clean separation and a maturity. 
And I don't really think that model view intent is really too different from model view view model. Um, model view view model to be reactive architecture, just you have to do more discipline. That's it. All right, so I took questions throughout this. I was really gonna wait for the end, but um, I'm only happy to stay a little longer. I was gonna go to bed at nine, have some tea. You don't get to do that around here, Dan. No, it's fine. I'd rather you know teach everybody um, things I've learned. I love doing what I do. Um, I don't just, you know, I'm not just the director of engineering at Viacom. I also run my own um, shop, making my own mobile apps, always trying to get better every day, have that second income stream. So um, I love to do this. I don't mind staying and taking some questions. So what can I help you out, you guys, with? I can go back. Any high level questions? <laughs> well, I have a low level question. Is there a way to do this without writing so much extra code? The amount of code that you had to write to do. MVC was much, much less than the amount of code that you showed us when you did MVVM. And I'm wondering if there are frameworks that cut through that and make it um, simpler and less, less cumbersome. Um, so or is that not a fair, did I, am I not making a fair assessment of the amount of code? No, it's, it's, it's a very good question. Um, the, the, the fair assessment was that in the MVC, that was just a very, you know, Fibonacci sequence. That wasn't actually fetching data from a server. If I needed to fetch data, there would be a lot more code there, obviously. Um, as far as frameworks, Rx itself is a framework. It's a threading model framework for reactive type of programming. That's the framework that you're using because if you didn't have that and, and you needed to build a multi-threaded application, you need to have thread pools, you need to have thread priority, you need to be able to know that everything on the Android has to be done in the main thread, update the UI, and having that complexity of saying, okay, I have multiple threads, I need to jump between different threads, I need to wait for this one to be done and join them together. It's, you lose all that with the Rx framework. With Rx framework, you get to basically hide and mask a lot of the threading techniques that you used to have to learn and do by hand. So that's your framework that you wanna be using is Rx itself. As far as a lot of code to be done, um, you gotta think of it like this slow is smooth and smooth is fast. If you write, if you have to write more code and be slow about it, you're going to be smoother and faster in the long run because you're not going to have as many bugs come back. This is on. what I tell everybody when they tell me that Java is too verbose a language, but they laugh at me. Maybe, maybe it's not the same argument that I'm making. Well, I think you heard from Patricia herself when she asked the question, like as a junior developer doing an MVC type of application, she noticed that when she makes one change in one spot and has to make a change everywhere else, if you have to do that on a 200 person team, you never get out the door. So the discipline is to move to a better architecture and say with MVP, MVVM, you now have an easier way to do this clean separation. You don't need to be as forceful. Um, you get to, to do interfaces everywhere with MVP or with MVVM, you basically bind and you don't care what the other implementation look like. You just care about binding to interface things like that so right yes more code yes but again slow is smooth and smooth is fast slow and steady wins the race maybe that one too sure I don't know. maybe well, it's uh, it's interesting that you should say that about slow is smooth and smooth is fast so that makes me wonder what is your background in racing where you learned that <laughs> <laughs> i i don't have i never raced uh I, I worked in the defense industry for a while um, where um, everything had to be quality assured. So um, working in the commercial world, when I first started doing Android development, nobody wanted to do testing. But when you have a million users paying millions of dollars and mobile becomes a bigger platform for some programs than the web, you know, you can't, you know, you can't do a financial transaction as example, lose people's money. So you really need to have a lot of tests around it, which means you get that discipline. So my background is more uh, from defense. Do we have other questions? Well, I'm not hearing. Might... Yeah, hello? Yeah, this is Brian again. This I just want to say, before you do that, I want to un, uh, unshare screen. Um, Dan, is that up to you to unshare your screen or do I do it? I could do it. Okay, and that way we can all see. Okay, good. Uh, so I was just wondering if there's any um, uh, 
downside, like as far as performance goes to using one over the other? I'm assuming you didn't mention anything. So if there is, it's probably minuscule, but um, between the architectures. Sure. Yeah. So I'm thinking of how to answer your question correctly, not ruling my eyes that I don't know. So there um two things came to mind. First was memory footprint. Obviously, as you create more objects, there's more memory you take up. So in the MVVM case, there will be more memory being passed around. Um, same with MVP because you got to create more classes. But as far as impacting the speed of the system, and memory is cheap. What you really want to have is you want to have a snappy UI. As long as you do a lot of this object creation on a background thread, it's not going to be a problem. So with a MVP, you know, and you use Dagger, you know, in my example, if you take a look at Dagger and you inject and you create all your objects up front, it's an upfront cost and it's there for the life cycle of somebody using the activity. So you're gaining a lot of more stability for almost the unrecognizable hit to the, to the UI. And the same with MVVM. Okay. Everything MVVM, everything was under the background. Everything. So all it was is here's your data that's it go update the UI, but all the other stuff done in the background thread. So that's where you do a lot of savings. With MVC, unless you call a thread that you create, you're not gonna, you know, you can end up doing a little bit more in the UI. The other one was so it was memory and speed. Yeah, those are the two that came to mind. So yeah. Okay. Cool. Other questions? Well, if there aren't any, I want to, Dan, thank you so much for doing this for us. We really appreciate oh, it. And we'll be posting this uh, video on YouTube. I'll get it together and uh, I'll post the URL on the Slack group. Dan, I'll send it to you, everybody else. Um, if you're signed up on the course spreadsheet that, or the, the spreadsheet that I've created, um, I'll give you an email directly. And hey, everybody, happy coding and we'll, 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 um, We'll see you next time. Thank you. You're welcome. Good luck, everybody. Thank in you, your guys. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Thanks again. Bye-bye.